Hallelujah. Amen and amen, brothers and sisters. We now move on to the last in the series of the Systematic Applied Kingdom Eschatological Studies, the suite of courses that starts with, you know, uh, dispensation seasons and times, and then the understanding the end times, the seven letters from heaven, uh, uh, and then uh, the completing the unfinished reformation, and the things to come, what next, and then this one now, Revelation unveiled. And by the grace of the Lord, the course code is 311. So stay with us. We're going to take it easy. Whatever extent we're able to cover, we bless the Lord for that. And we trust the Lord that this series will help us to truly understand the things to come. Let us pray. Father in heaven, the great I am who I am, we bless you for who you are. You are a God who is a speaking God. From Genesis to Revelation, we see you speaking by your spirit. And Lord, we thank you that this book that has been hidden, covered, you want to unveil it for us. You don't want us to walk in darkness in the end of the age. Have your way by your spirit and give us meat from your word. Thank you for answering in Yeshua Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. By way of introduction, one of the greatest and most successful attacks of Satan against the church since the 4th century has been to induce a state of systemic blindness. This is not uh, just blindness, but one that is systemic. The result is that certain portions of the Holy Scriptures are covered, are obscured, are not known, and the very thing that the Lord meant for the church, the bride of Yeshua, the body of Yeshua, to be ready for her head and her king, her master, her groom, the very scripture that kind of shows us the end of the wicked and the end of righteousness, the ultimate end, which is the book of Revelation, is largely treated out of is allowed treated as something to be ignored and people are in ignorance of what it says. Some people's the approach to it is that of fear of certain passages and they are fearful. And some other people, what they do is to disdain some of the interpretations that are a little bit, you know, off the, you know, over the top. And so the Lord wants us to kind of demystify this and just get into what he wants us to do. And the methodology we adopted is to wait on the Lord like he told us to break down what we had in the understanding the end times into three books, and that's what we're doing. And some of the things we're going to see in the book of Revelation, we've already dealt with them. We're not going to, you know, redeal with them. We we'll just mentioned them in passing so that we can go to some of the things we have not dealt with, and they are very important things. And so, brothers and sisters, it is so strange that some Christian groups, they don't read this at all. They don't at all. Some groups, I'm talking about major Christian denominations, major Christian entities. And so we're going to, you know, trust the Lord to guide us along, wait on Him, where He gives us real light, we disclose it, where we don't have enough light, we allow Him to speak to us through the word as it is written. Even in making the commentary, we're not going to take the liberty of academic scholars of the Bible to go and make a lot of disputations and all that. No. We're just going to take on what we consider a simple flow from Genesis to Revelation. What is it? Kingdom given, Genesis chapter 1. Genesis 3, kingdom lost. And then from chapter 4 all the way to the book of Revelation is the story of recovery. And then in the gospel, we saw Yeshua come incarnated to do the first part of the recovery of the kingdom process, which is to pay the price with his own blood after teaching what the kingdom is all about. And then the whole story of the Bible is the reality that he will come again, put down all rebellion, all evil, and will establish the manifest kingdom on earth. And after the manifest kingdom, then he would, you know, basically, you know, then reconcile all things to the Father then, the mystery of Elohim will accomplish, and then by the grace of the Father, there will be no more mystery, and then we're going to live with Elohim forever and ever. Meanwhile, all the wicked 
those who rejected his salvation are going to spend eternity in hell in the lake of fire brimstone with Satan, including those who were believers but allowed themselves to backslide. So, brothers and sisters, this is such an important work, and it's so strange that the church would have allowed the enemy to make her to drop what the Lord gave as a compass into the future, a clear marker of what lies ahead. And so we trust him that he will just at bring it up to us and make us understand these things clearly. So we're going to start with Revelation chapter 1. What does it say from verse 1? The revelation of Jesus Christ, you know, that's Yeshua HaMashiach, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified by his angel unto his servant John, who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things which he saw. Now this is important that we get this. This book is a revelation of Yeshua. Jesus is a revelation of him, the Messiah, because he's going to end with the triumph which he will triumph over all things of darkness. It's essentially about him who as the second Adam will close out the human age, then above and beyond all else, the truth in the book speaks about him and events leading to establishment of the kingdom in the earth rim and the, the end of all things. And then we see here that by the grace of the Lord, Yahweh, our Heavenly Father, gave him the revelation to show his servants. And the book is about things that must shortly come to pass. That's what it says there, where we read, you know, uh, Revelation chapter 1, verse 1 and 2. Things that must shortly come to pass. Now, this book was given about AD 95, and it's been about 2,000 plus years. But as Peter explained in Second Peter chapter 3, verse 8, But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The way the Lord counts time is not the way we count time. His ways are higher than our ways, as Isaiah 55 says. So this is where people miss him. They, 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 do, they, they tend to forget that our mind is not the same as the mind of Elohim. So why has he taken all these 2,000 years plus till this time? The reason is that the Lord knows that the doors of grace he keeps open so that as many as possible will come in. And over the years, people have been streaming into the kingdom, pressing into the kingdom. Brothers and sisters, we are told again that Jesus signified it by his angel to his servant John the Beloved. In, the back, in this book, you're going to see the angel. The angel, he spoke with this angel. He spoke the angel, gave him this. And that's what he also did, the agency of an angel to interact with John. And then we see where it said, John, bear record of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus and all things he saw. So John simply documented faithfully the things that were revealed to him. Ready to say this of right here. The book of Revelation is not a chronological account. This one happens after this one, this one after this one. There are some places where the things fit in into a chronological framework after this, this, that. But generally, John saw a series of revelations, a series of visions. And those visions, he simply wrote them down. And it is now for Holy Spirit to guide with the principle in Isaiah, a little here, a little there, you know, a little here, a little there. We can be able to piece together things. And so what we're going to do is to allow Holy Spirit to basically lead us into the mind of the Father. We are not going to be using any preconceived um, denominational biases or opinion or look at what a man said. Holy Spirit who gave it is able to interpret it. Verse 3, blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. Now, this is a book that is unlike any other book. This is a book with a promise. Blessed is he that readeth. So, if you read it alone, on your own, you are blessed for simply reading. And they that hear the words of prophecy, like now we are in a class, we are hearing or in a church, you do it public reading, you say there's a blessing. 
And he says the words of this prophecy, Revelation is the biggest prophetic book, is the biggest. 22 chapters of prophecy from the time John received it till the time it will all be consummated. Some of them have been consummated already. Some of them are in the process, and some of them will come when Yeshua's second coming are there. So it's a word of prophecy, very accurate prophecy, pinpoint accurate, so to say. And he said, blessed are those who read. That's personal. You read. You are blessed. You hear. He's spoken to you. You are blessed for hearing. And then, and keep those things which are written therein. That the greatest blessing, of course, is for those who keep the word. The book of Revelation is not supposed to be read like literature, read to just feel good or, you know, that you know a Bible. No, it's a book that if you understand it and if you receive the word inside of you, it changes your life, your worldview. It changes your perspective of life. It makes you see things in the right context. And if there's any one book that can actually make everyone to stay on a narrow way and to be, you know, watching and waiting for the return of the Lord, this book will do it more than any other book. And that is the essence of this book. So there's a blessing for reading. There's a blessing for hearing. And there's a blessing for keeping, for observing, for the word being profitable. Remember Joshua 1, 3, this book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth. But you shall meditate upon it day and night that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written there. For then shall you make your way prosperous and have good success. So here the prophecy is clear. To read, you are blessed. To hear, you are blessed. To do, based on what you read and what you hear, you are blessed. Men and brethren, he say, for the time is at hand. So don't take the book of Revelation and read it or hear it and then brush it aside. Treat it as a clarion call. Treat it as a clarion call to say the Lord wants us to live in a particular way. The book of Revelation, part of why it's given, is to help every generation of Christians to live as if they are the last generation. This is something important the Lord revealed to me one day. If you read the book, the way Paul wrote, sorry, the way Peter wrote, you discover that they wrote in the context and all books in the Bible that if you read and allow it to walk in you, both to will and to do of the good pleasure of the Father, you will not miss it. Men and brethren, then he says in verse 4, John to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you and peace from him that which is and which was and which is to come and from the seven spirits which are before his throne and from yeah, Jesus Christ who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth unto him that loved us and washed us from our own sins in his own blood. Men and brethren, this message was primarily delivered to the seven churches in, of Asia Minor. The number seven represents completion to that extent, it is a message for Christians of the entire church age. The entire church age. Both the time that was, the time that will be, and the time to the end. It was a message to all to that extent. Men and brethren, he said the message is from he who is, who was, and is to come. This reflects the name of Yahweh, for instance. The I am who I am. When Moses said, who, who do I tell them? He's sending me. When he was met with in the burning bush, you know that name represents that he is who he is, he was, he is, he will be, you know, and that message shows that the Father is involved in this message. And then he said, "I'm from also." He said, "I'm from the seven spirits of God." What does that mean? Does it mean seven different spirits? No, it's a message also from Holy Spirit. And the seven here is not about seven different, but captures the fullness of Holy Spirit. And remember also in Isaiah 11 verse 2, it tells us that the spirit of Elohim that will be upon Yeshua, he began to counsel might and all the things that he said there, completeness. And the message is also from Jesus, Yeshua, the faithful witness. He was the first to rise from the dead. As 1 Corinthians chapter 15 expounds, he is also the prince of the kings of the earth. 
All authority is given unto him. When he rose from the dead, he said, All power and authority is given unto me. Matthew 28, 18. And then as Romans 13, 1 to 8 says, All human authority derives from, you know, him. Yes, we know that people go to Satan to, to make them as the God of this world. But whoever the Lord does not approve will not be able to live a day. Will not be able to stay. So at the end of the day, all are subject to him. He loved us. The Bible says, he says here, yeah, and he washed us from our sins in his own blood. He washed us. He took the plate. You know, he took our bodies upon himself. And his blood was released to wash us from our sins so that we are holy unto him. Verse 6, and has made us kings and priests unto God and his father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Yeshua made us priests, kings and priests to the father. In this present time, we function in measures of this dual, dual office, priests and kings. As priests, what do we do? We stand before Elohim and humans. You stand between Elohim and humans. That's what priests do. We bring the causes of humans to Elohim and we bring his own causes to them. When you stand in intercession, you are doing a priestly duty. Then what do kings do? Kings legislate, kings issue decree, kings also proclamations. So also, even today, when you decree a thing and it's established unto you, establishing kingdom authority, what do you do in prayer? You know, certain rims of prayer, when you learn how to pray authoritatively according to the kingdom principles, Yeshua said, whatever you bind on earth is bound in heaven. Whatever you bind on earth, heaven says yes to it. Whatever you lose on earth, heaven says yes to it. So that's what the kingly. And so from the rim of the natural, the rim of the earth rim, you legislate into the spiritual rim. And from there, you affect things that happen. People can be thousands of years, uh, thousands of miles away or kilometers away. And you can pray and take their hearts, authorities, and put in the hand of the Most High. That's what we are doing as priests and kings. But there's a dimension of it that is still ahead when Yeshua returns, when we are going to rule over physical nations and territories and cities. You know what? When Yeshua comes, we are going to be joint heirs. If you hold on to the end, we'll be joint heirs with him. We'll be co-rulers with him. He will be in Jerusalem to rule as great potentate over the whole world. And then he will assign people over nations. Somebody, um, somebody will rule America as a nation. Then the various states of America, people will rule over that. The various counties, the various cities, people will rule over faithful people. Also, all over the world. When Yeshua returns, brothers and sisters, for the manifest kingdom, he's not going to rule alone. All over the world, people are, well, you see, the world will not be destroyed. Human beings will not be wiped out when Yeshua returns. No, it's something we're going to maybe bring again to your attention that there will be like you have this amnesty program. You stay in a land where you are an Ill alien for some years, and then a law comes in, you have up to 10 years, you become a citizen. In the same way, our people are going to transmute into the kingdom. And they have, they are right now on earth. Over half of the people on earth, over 4 billion people have no consciousness of Elohim. They are blank, totally blank. It will take those who on this earth receive the Lord and the kingdom, who understand it, and they will be appointed across the world to rule over those people who came into the kingdom, the manifest kingdom, when Yeshua returns. So we're going to rule with him. And that is there. I say, we, I say to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Yeshua deserves dominion and glory following successful conclusion of his earthly assignment. Then verse 7, he says, Behold, he comes with the clouds. And every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him, even so. Amen. What, do we, what is the commentary there? The second coming of Yeshua will be visible to all humans. 
It's not going to be Yeshua himself warned in the book of Matthew 24. If they say to you, he's over there, don't believe them. He's over there. He's in the desert. He's in cave. Don't believe anyone. Why? It's going to be evident, self-evident. Everything will be clear. His coming will be so clear. The second coming of the Lord is not going to be surreptitious. The first one was covered where heaven invaded the earth rim and Yeshua was planted in the womb of Mary by the angel, and nobody but Mary knew, and later, Joseph knew, later, you know, Elizabeth knew, later, Simon and Anna knew. Listen, the second coming will be visible to all, and the Lord wants us to know that, and of course, the Jew, you know, the day he ascended to heaven, in Acts chapter 1, verse 9 to 11, the angels saw them gazing up to heaven and say, you men of God, what are you doing right here? As you see Yeshua going bodily, so will he come back also bodily. So it's going to be clear, men and brethren. And then, of course, the Jews who rejected Yeshua at his first coming shall wail at his second coming. They will rue all the things they had to go through, all the things they went through when they rejected the revelation, and all the effort clinging to Moses all came to nothing. They're going to wail. Well, that they missed it. Well, that hey, this is what he said, and that, and by the grace of the Lord, they will not be in a position to say Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Haruka Bama. You know, brothers and sisters, the Lord wants all of us to know these things. Then in verse eight, he says, "I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending," says the Lord, which is, which was, which is to come, the Almighty. So here, Yeshua says it's the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending. You know, the Greek word, letters, Alpha, the beginning, Omega, the ending. He is a, it's an open and closed case. You see him in the book of Revelation, I mean, Genesis 1. You see him in Revelation also. He is the beginning and the ending. Everything about Elohim, everything about Elohim, he is the way, the truth, the life. And he is the author and the finisher of our faith. Everything is about him. Then he is so almighty. The divinity of Yeshua is clearly established in the book of Revelation. You know, and, and Revelation kind of brings together the issue of the blessed triune nature of Elohim, the blessed trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, in different passages is emphasized. Then in verse 9, I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation, and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, who was in the isle that is called Patmos, for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. The person who is doing the writing, Yeshua, is actually the author. But the one he gives the revelation to, as he write down, is John. John the beloved. John who was close to him, intimate with him. John displays humility by calling himself a brother and companion in tribulation. He was in tribulation when he got this. Men and brethren, when he received the vision of the book of Revelation, it was a time he was banished to the island of Patmos. A windswept, hard rock, very tiny, hard rock, like an island off the west coast of Turkey in the South Asian region. Men and brethren, church history says John was to be, you know, killed like the other believers, but his own case, they put, dropped him in a pot of hot boiling oil. Nothing happened to him. Nothing happened to him because Yeshua had proposed and given a prophetic word in the book of John. You know, towards the end of the book of John, he told Peter, what is it to you if I, live, if I, will, if I wish that John will live to see my glory? And that was what he was referring to. That John will live to see the glory of the resurrected, ascended, and glorified Yeshua. So John was to be killed. They couldn't, out of frustration, they took him and threw him into that island of Patmos. And John, though he was suffered intense persecution, his spirit was not broken. He had a good attitude which made him open to receive his important, this important message for the church. Brothers and sisters, there are many people, many Christians, when they are going through, they allow their souls to be bitter and full of gall, and therefore they shut off their spiritual arteries. It is through persecution, it is through fire that gold comes forth. 
when you are going through issues, it's not time to complain with your tongue. It's not a time with your attitude to shut off from God. It's a time to be open because the Lord has appointed that it's through tribulation that we possess the fullness of the kingdom. Brothers and sisters, John was in the right attitude. And in verse 10, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. I had behind me a great voice as of a trumpet saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. What thou seest, write in a book, send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, unto Smyrna, unto Pegamos, unto Thyatira, unto Sardis, unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. So John was in the spirit on the Lord's day. This could mean that the Lord spoke to his spirit, man, and he was saw a vision, and the visions came to him vividly. It could also mean he had an out-of-body experience, like the type that, that Paul had in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1 to 7, where Paul was literally, his spirit man was inducted to see the mysteries of the heavenlies. Whichever one, we don't need to speculate. It could be either just a vision, because to see vision, you are neither asleep nor awake, and then the spirit man is active. Then the voice of Yeshua in his glorified state sounded to him like a trumpet. It was huge. And Yeshua introduced himself for the second time as the Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. It's emphasized. And John was instructed to document the revelations into a book. And then the names of the seven churches, which are in Asia Minor, that first received this message, is given. They, they are all in the region of modern-day Turkey, Asia Minor. You see, Turkey sits on two continents. Turkey sits at the, the junction of two continents. This is Asia. Turkey is part of it. This is Europe. Turkey is part of it. And that is a peculiar place. Some of the things about the book of Revelation, they were localized there in terms of the churches. Those seven churches are written there today. They are now tourist sites. They are no longer there. It is evident that the warnings of Yeshua were not taken seriously. And some of them have finished their testimony and their cause. We're going to allow this to be the first, and then we're going to go on to the next set of things tomorrow. The next tomorrow, we go on so that we can get it right. Because once you get it right with this first chapter, then other things will fit in. Brothers and sisters, this is an important book. It's a book every Christian should know. Not only adults, even children. And what we are trusting the Lord is that from what he shared with, you know, over the past few days, that he will bring this clarity so much that even a child, you know, who anyone who is literate enough to read will be able to get something that will help you to be open to read and receive from the Lord. So we're not going to go into all those sloganeerings of denominations who want to, you know, stay where their founder saw 50 years ago, 100 years ago, 200 years ago. We're going to go open what is the Lord saying by his spirit, what life is it bringing upon the books so that we can understand. And then we're not going to go too much outside the scripture and trying to bring commentary. No, we'll stay within. And this will take you to understand this book. And this book, if you are open, it will help you on the journey of life. We love you. And one who said this to you, can you share with us three key things you have learned today in this first book, and then in this first lesson, and which passages or verses, give any two passages that particularly touched you. And this is it for today. We're going to pray. And then we'll continue. Father in heaven, the great I am who I am, we thank you for the opportunity to get into the book of Revelation. Revelation unveiled. Have your way and glorify Yeshua. Lord, we just surrender this vessel to your hand, the Holy Spirit. You will do a profound work through this vessel that I will not, my self nature, my, 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 my soul will not intrude to what you want to do. Let it be pure and uncomplicated. And Father, we pray that you touch the saints to share these with their friends and relatives so that we all can come to that place where our knowledge is perfected 
Do it for your name's sake in Yeshua's name. Amen. Can I ask you to please share this video with friends and relatives on and off Facebook. Have a blessed day. Bye-bye.